Good morning and welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church in the season of Epiphany. For those who are able to brave the conditions this morning, all that rain last night, uh, those who might be having roof issues with leaks, ba basement issues, dogs going out multiple times in the rain last night, no stories, maybe afterwards. The Lord has brought us here this morning. And for those who are watching on Facebook Live uh, right now or perhaps later today or this week, oh, about five folks that we can see. Again, uh, we're thankful that we can be together in worship and fellowship. Good to share good news that uh, Nettie Webb is home and making progress already. Uh, I know that she and her parents would certainly appreciate your continued prayers as she goes the the path of uh, rehab and recuperation, but uh, good sign so far. We'll continue to pray for her. We have a great joy to share this morning. Uh, many of you all probably saw in the email or heard in other ways that Bill and Lisa Rosevere are grandparents. Woohoo! Uh, Thursday, Sadie, Grace, Rose, and I don't know how to say their la the last name, Bonema. Bonama, thank you. For stress on the first syllable or syllable. Bonama. Um, Mom, um, Nicole, and Dad, Brad, and Baby are all doing well. Um, and so why don't we take an opportunity just to pray at this moment and then um, focus our hearts to give thanks. Lord God, we thank you for the, the gift of new life, for the birth of Sadie, and for her parents. Nicole and Brad, for her grandparents, for all those who will love her and help her to grow. Watch over her and her family in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today is Betsy Lane's birthday. Happy birthday, Betsy. She did not get an early birthday gift last week, unfortunately, with the Bills, but uh, they played a good game. The two words that any Bills fan hates to hear more than anything else is wide right. <laughs> really hard words. But they played a great, they did, they played a really good game. So um, again, uh, happy birthday. Uh, great that uh, we can celebrate that. Um, a week from today, uh, Taylor and Braden will be celebrating their birthday. Um, Woohoo, that's right. Which of you two dislike sharing your birthday more with the other? Y'all are so good. That's great. It's not like you've really had a choice since the beginning, right? So... Um, Lewis and Esther just uh, came in this morning. Great to see you back, Esther, who's been under the, the heavy weight of medical school stuff, a new semester. Lewis, how is your dad doing? Good. Please keep, continue to keep uh, Lewis's dad, Lewis, in your prayers, um, and we're thankful for them being with us this morning. How many of you all have turned in your devotions for Lent? Well, hallelujah, Karen. A journey of a thousand miles begins, but with a single or two devotions from Karen, as I throw pencils. We need devotions. Lots of devotions. The good news is, the prompt is in your bulletin. The theme is loved. Share time when God loved you through a trial, big or small. That's something that we should be able to do. Again, it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to come from your heart. And know that uh, there will be a blessing uh, in the writing and for those who are uh, reading them as well. Um, Bill, we are, we prayed and lifted up Sadie and uh, Nicole and Brad, so good to see you here this morning. 
Also, uh, this Thursday, uh, we have our Thursday dinner. It is a bring your dinner, but other things like, I guess, drinks and desserts will be provided. Are there other announcements that folks might want to lift up this morning? Well, it's great that we can be together in worship and fellowship. Let us uh, prepare to worship God as Susan brings forward the light of Christ. I invite you to stand and body your spirit for our call to worship. Come, let us give thanks to God with our whole hearts. Glory to the one whose wonders are to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Come, let us give thanks to God.
Let us pray together our congregational prayer. Almighty God, light from light, who commands the universe and all that is made, your word is the power that makes whole what was broken, the force of good and the food of peace. Teach us now as you taught in the synagogue. Heal us now so that in all that we say and do, the freedom we have in you may be for others too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Invite Karen to come forward for Old Testament reading. The Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord.
invite Ella to come forward for our gospel reading. Today's gospel reading is Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, the man with an unclean spirit. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord.
You may be seated. We have a few more members of our choir filtering in from the back, so we'll give them a chance to sit down. How appropriate was that anthem given the weather that we had yesterday? Amen? Amen. Yeah, they, they, they truly nailed that. That was, that was special. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we love to tell the old, old story. Help us, Lord, to also hear it new and fresh this morning. For your word quickens us, encourages us, feeds us, and challenges us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you indeed are a rock and redeemer. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Pastors are notorious for lots of things, unfortunately. One of those things, and I'm going to commit that sin this morning, try not to do it too often, is a love of alliteration. Did y'all ever have a pastor that liked alliteration? They get, you know, everything starts with an A, and, you know, the three points are A this, A this, and A this, or C this, and C this, and C this. Well, this morning, I can't help myself. In the passage, we have amazed and astounded. Either one of those could have been translated astonished or awestruck. So I ask you all, in this world, for those of you who have been here for a shorter time or a longer time, when in your life have you ever been amazed, astounded, astonished, or awestruck? Yes, Belva. Mount McKinley, or uh, now it's called Denali. But absolutely, when you saw it, it was Mount McKinley. Things, names changed, but it was still, absolutely. I've heard amazing things from people that have seen that. It, it probably just took your breath away, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. What are some other things that have amazed, astonished, astounded, or left you awestruck? Garland. The first time you saw the Grand Canyon. How many people have seen the Grand Canyon? We got several folks. Absolutely. It just, just absolutely was like, Lord, this is more than just a big hole, I guess, right? I haven't seen it. Yes, uh, yes. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Amen. That's right. Sometimes it doesn't have to be something that's spectacular, but the fact that you were paying attention and watching and noticing it. A couple more. Yes. Wow. Wow. That sounds, yeah. So I've heard some natural wonders. Anybody ever seen Niagara Falls? That's probably one that hopefully was, was meaningful. Amen. I was, I was waiting on that. Especially Bill back there. Amen. That's right. New life. The the birth of a newborn baby, whether it's your child or a grandchild or anyone, that it, 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 it captures the power of life and new life and, and the hope that is filled in that. So y'all have done a wonderful job. We, we have 
natural wonders, those things that, that can leave us breathless or amazed or astonished or astounded or awestruck. We also can have man-made things, but yet powerful. Yes, Garland? Amen. I was wondering. Part of me was like, is Garland going to bring up a train? And you didn't, and I was so disappointed, and then you came through. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm Peggy looks so proud back there. Yes? Right. Right. So what causes us to be amazed or astounded or astonished or awestruck? We've described some things that do that for us, but why do we respond or feel or have that emotion? How would we describe it? Or is it ineffable, right? Maybe we can't describe it very easily. It's so big, right? It's, it's, more, it's more than, yes. Kathy. It goes above and beyond what we could picture before. It goes beyond even our imagination or what is mundane or typical or common. What else? Right. Yeah. Bell was saying it, it helps us to recognize how small we are. It puts it in perspective that uh, in God's creation, how much larger that is. Yes, right. It surprises us, right? It catches us unawares, and perhaps it captivates us in a way that other things don't. So in our, our previous... Um, week's gospel lesson we had Jesus calling some of the disciples to follow him and a few days later they traveled to the synagogue for Jesus to teach I haven't had the occasion to be a guest preacher much but let me tell you it's an interesting place to be because on one hand you've got complete freedom because guess what? You can say whatever you want and you can run out the door. Right. On the flip side, more often than not, you don't know the congregation. Right? And that's a lot of what we do is when we share the good news of Jesus Christ, we do so in a particular time and place to a particular people. So now we don't know exactly, it doesn't say in this scripture and some of the other scriptures, we have the people or the crowd saying, isn't that Joseph's son, right? What is he doing? Can we really believe what he's saying? Or even to the point of, can anything good come from Nazareth? So we don't have that in this particular passage or story, but we do have the reaction of the people that they were amazed or astounded or astonished by what? What did that for them? In the passage. The power and authority of his what? His teaching, right? In comparison to who? The scribes, right? Now, when we hear the word authority, is that a neutral term, a positive term, or a negative term? All of the above, Peggy says. There was some murmuring. That was nice. 
it should be, in a perfect world, a positive term, right? At the very least, it should be what? A neutral term. But more often than not, when we hear the word authority, it is a negative. And why is that? So people appealing to their authority to do or to say something, to tell you that you have to do something, or you're wrong because I am the authority. And yet, this is not the authority that they're describing with Jesus. They're talking about the nature of him in his teaching, unlike the scribes who do the best they can. But they're not the Son of God. Jesus teaches and preaches with authority and power because he gets that from his Father. And it's a freeing authority. Jesus opens up the possibilities for the folks. He doesn't narrow it. Because if he narrowed it and he said something that honestly didn't really impact them, they wouldn't have been amazed and astounded and astonished and awestruck. Diana Butler Bass, who's a a pastor and a wonderful writer, she tells us, in in her mind, what is the opposite of being amazed, astounded, astonished, or awestruck? What would that be? Scared? Could be. That could be an emotion. Huh? Confused? Could be. Sometimes we can be amazed, astounded, astonished, and awestruck and still be confused. Bored. Oh, Belva. You were the one who said it? Bored. How about cynical? How about jaded? Bored, cynical, jaded. When we're bored and cynical and jaded... Are we experiencing anything that changes us and helps us to grow and be transformed? No. We tune it out. We're like, is it going to be a long sermon today or are we going to be able to get to lunch before the Baptists? Hmm. So he preaches and teaches with authority and power. And they listen. They were amazed and astonished and astounded and awestruck. But you know who in the synagogue was not amazed, astonished, astounded, or awestruck? Who wasn't? Huh? No, no, that very day in the synagogue, who was not amazed, astonished, astounded, awestruck? The man with the demon! You know why we know he's not amazed, astounded, astonished, or awestruck? Because he accurately says who Jesus is, right? He accurately identifies Jesus as who? The Holy One of Israel. And in that state, kind of taunts Jesus about, go ahead and drive me out. Jesus says what? You just simmer down there, over there. And drives out the demon 
And now how are the people responding? They're what? Amazed, astonished, astounded, and awestruck. Because they have seen Jesus exercise or show what? Authority. He has authority. He can even drive out demons. Who is this person that can do this? And it says then that the news of that stayed in the synagogue? Is that what happened? No, it did what? Because guess what? They loved to tell the story. Gosh, you're going to wake up. They love to tell the story. It's been said, if you have to gossip, gossip good news. Amen? If you have to talk about somebody else, say something good about them. Here's something I want you all to pay attention to. And it's not any, you know, huge insight. There's nothing original. But if you're visiting with somebody, it's two of you, and let's say y'all don't have the closest relationship or whatever, you're, there's some people that you can just be with and you don't have to talk. You know what that's like? You just hang out. You feel comfortable with that person. But other people, you feel kind of obligated to keep a conversation going. Pay attention to how long it takes before you start talking about a third person. Seriously. Pay attention. And pay attention whether that is positive or neutral or negative. Pay attention to that. Because all too often that's our human nature. We're uncomfortable. So Jesus, he taught with authority. But it wasn't him lording it over them. He drove out the demon, but it wasn't to put on a show for the synagogue. He did it because he brought good news there and now for that person. And hopefully it was good news that was then shared further out. But we have a crisis of authority in our culture because most of our authority figures, or so too many of them, kind of a mess including pastors because pastors are sinners this pastor is a sinner there was a survey that said that pastors have the, the same regard in people's minds as chiropractors I will leave that to you whether that's good or bad. I've only had one experience with a chiropractor, and it was a positive experience. Now, he wasn't working on my back, but that's another story. We live in a culture and a society where, and again, this comes understandably from what people have experienced. Some of y'all's generation, no offense, not my generation, y'all heard this, never trust anyone over 30. Okay. That's actually pretty generous. I bet at one point it was 25, but they moved it. But certainly 30. Rodney, you ever heard that? You said it pretty easily. Yeah. 
it probably was an understandable reaction to what people experienced. So we have a crisis of authority. And there's no way to reclaim that by exercising power. There's no way to force people to say, you will submit to this authority. Because that isn't the kind of authority that Jesus exercises. His authority is, a, is, is freely given and freely received and freely accepted. If we want to be the people that tell the old, old story, then people have to see, why do these people live differently than those other people? What's about them that makes them different? I want to know what their secret is. That's the kind of authority and authenticity that the world is looking for. That's what the world needs. It doesn't need a bunch of Christians that say, well, you know, if you just did this and you just did that, you just got your life together, and, you know, if you believe this and you believe that, and, you know, you're just a mess. The world doesn't need that. Our culture doesn't need that. Our society doesn't need that. They need to see that they will know we are Christians. Oh, y'all are finally waking up. I know, your blood sugar's getting low. They'll know we are Christians by our love, and they will know Jesus by our love. Now, the good news is, Jesus is already working in their lives. We are not the authorities. We do not come having all the answers. We walk side by side with people. And we listen. And we pay attention. We notice how cool it is when there's some steam or something different coming off the ice. We pay attention. We are not quick to give answers. We are not quick to condemn. But we walk with someone and say, It's hard. But I know my Jesus is with me. And I know Jesus is with you. That's the kind of authority the world needs. Thanks be to God. Amen. It is great to have Joanne back this morning. After a few weeks from having a procedure, thank you so much for being here this morning, praying for healing for you. Absolutely. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you and praise you for your great love in Jesus Christ, for your patience with us, You teach us, Lord, through your word that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Help us, Lord, not to be people of knowledge and quick answers and certainty, but rather the difficult path of patient and persistent love and presence. 
starting here within our own community, Lord, that we might love one another, encourage one another, build one another up. We pray that, Lord, for our other Mountain View District churches and for the Virginia Conference and for the United Methodist Church and for our sisters and brothers in Christ and other churches, denominations in Lynchburg and throughout this world. Help us, Lord, to be a light that shines brightly but that does not blind does not cause people to turn away, but rather lights a path that we can take together and looking for those moments of being amazed and astonished and astounded and awestruck in your creation and your goodness and how, Lord, you are working for your kingdom to be on earth as it is. In heaven. We pray, Lord, for those who need your healing touch and those who journey with them, for those who mourn this day, for the gift of new life for Sadie, for those going through treatment and awaiting answers and guidance and direction. For our homebound, for those who feel isolated, alone, or anxious. For those who are incarcerated. For those outside these walls, on these streets. For their hopes and dreams and fears and concerns. For our continuing prayers for healing and righteousness and justice in the Middle East, and so many places, Lord, where we don't even understand or consider the depth of pain and suffering. Help us, Lord, to trust in your goodness, to recognize the presence, the power, and the direction of your Holy Spirit in our lives as individuals, in our families, in our church, to build up the body of Christ, that in the way that we live, we may point to Christ and magnify him. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus and his authority that is grounded in humility and love. And so we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray together our congregational prayer blessing. For earth which you have molded, for creatures and animals, plants, water, air, and fire, for Jesus who died and rose again, for the breath of life we give you thanks, O God. Let these gifts be used for good wherever there is need, 
in the name of all that you have first given to us, especially Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. I invite us to be looking with the eyes of faith as we journey out into the world, to be recognizing and looking for the signs of God at work, to be amazed and astonished and astounded and awestruck of our great God. And may that experience transform us so that we may reflect the light of Christ. And Taylor will lead out the light of Christ. You too also carry out the light of Christ. Shalom to you.